Hello, um, this lecture is going to discuss some recent trends in art in China and the dividing point that is often used in the study of Chinese art and particularly in the contemporary period is 1989, particularly the June 4th, 1989 Tiananmen Square incident. Uh, what happened in 1989, it was basically uh, a culmination of some kind of um, um, tensions that were building in Chinese society. Uh, let's see, so back up a little bit here. In 1976, Mao Zedong, the Communist Party chairman and leader of uh, China from 1949 until 1976, died. And after he died, there was a kind of brief moment of a struggle for power, and then Deng Xiaoping became the next ruler of the or leader of the Communist Party and essentially de facto ruler of China. Deng Xiaoping was a little bit more of a pragmatist than Mao Zedong, and he was a economic liberalizer, meaning that he allowed more foreign investment, he allowed, and actually his policies have continued, and maybe even gotten since 2000, really, um, he, he died uh, quite some time ago, but his policies have continued to be in place in China to allow more and more economic activity, uh, especially since the 2000s. With this economic liberalization, there was a period of a little bit more intellectual liberalization in China from, say, about 1984 until this movement culminates in 1989, where you have a good number of students and um, young people who are gathering at university and um, talking about the idea of democracy. And in Beijing in particular, the capital city of China, um, this underground, essentially underground movement pushing for more democracy, pushing for a more open society, for reform of the government, um, they start meeting in public. They start having mass protests in the streets. And in Beijing in 87 and 88, particularly when um, a very popular education minister dies and uh, he had been a popular kind of uh, promoter of the idea of more intellectual freedom in China, uh, this movement comes to a head. So in the summer, the, early, the spring and early summer of um, 1989, student protesters start gathering in Tiananmen Square. Remember, I was mentioning this in, in the Chinese class before. Tiananmen Square is this great public square that is outside of the Forbidden City, the old imperial palace in Beijing. It is an important place where, I mean, in 1949, when Mao Zedong and the Communist Party got control of the People's Republic, that's where they made their big announcement. It's a major public gathering space. And so you have, in the spring and summer of 89, more and more marches and protests that are promoting the idea of democracy. In June, June 4th of 1989, this comes to a head when there's this mass number of people on the street um, gathering. They have signs, they have banners, they're shouting slogans. A group of art students from the local university made a mock-up of the um, Statue of Liberty and they called her the Goddess of Democracy. So they had this giant paper mache version of the Statue of Liberty that they're parading through the streets. The government decides that this is too much. They've had too much of this um, uh, uh, protest and that they need to do something about it. So they literally sent tanks into Tiananmen Square to um, to stop these protesters. Now the protesters don't have any guns, they don't have any weapons, they're peacefully protesting. Uh, there's quite a famous shot. There at the, at the top is a shot of, you know, the, the masses gathered before the confrontation. There at the bottom is a very famous still um, of a videotape that was rolling live on CNN and people were watching this around the world. There's a, a line of tanks rolling into Tiananmen Square and there is a lone student who's standing in front of the tanks willing them, you know, daring them to run him over and wanting him to, wanting them to stop. Um, what ended up happening to that guy isn't known. It's in the tape he, you know, is not run over. I mean, we don't see him get run over, but we don't know what happened to him. Other people did get run over. I'm showing you there on the right a photograph of some people who had been run over by tanks in the um, in the melee that ensued when the government sends in soldiers to shut down this protest. The official numbers that of people who were injured or killed in the Tiananmen Square protest it varies depends on, depending on whether you talk to the, the Red Cross or whether you talk to the um, Chinese government. The Chinese government says 
or or news sources who were there. Um, the New York Times, I think, put the official death toll. Their guesstimate was around 400 dead. The um, Pu People's Republic of China said not nearly, you know, maybe like 30 people were injured in the protest. The Red Cross statements have varied, but they are, their guesstimate is up to about 4,000 people dead or injured in this protest. So a very, very public, very visible crackdown on student protest in Tiananmen Square with a really devastating aftermath. This was a turning point in Chinese society. Uh, it put an end for a long time to any kind of organized protest for democracy or any kind of above ground um, discussion of the current political and um, intellectual climate in China. It also was one of those moments that brought China's um, abuses of human rights to international attention. When I teach about this, people often ask, you know, well, gee, what did the U.S. government do? The government really didn't do much in reaction to Tiananmen Square because we had normalized relations with China and we had strong diplomatic ties to China. I think the U.S. government under um, the first President Bush issued some kind of statement saying, you know, we deplore this act, but nothing, no real sanctions or anything like happened because of uh, Tiananmen Square. What it did do was it kind of changed the discourse uh, in China. And so it became an important spark or an important moment that um, inspired and changed the way that artists dealt with uh, their own society in Chinese art. Case in point here is this is a, a early 90s painting called Portrait of the Artist and His Friends. The artist's name is Yue Minjun. That's a photograph of him there on the bottom left, and there you can see his painting. He is a what is called a cynical realist. Now, you may remember if you were in the Chinese class, uh, I was talking about socialist realism. This is this um, uh, this style of realistic looking painting that was inspired in part by the socialist realist painting of the Soviet Union and was often used as propaganda to kind of um, educate the masses about the glories of the communist regime in China. Yue Minjun in cynical realism takes that vocabulary of oil painting and of western style realism and then puts it to this rather cynical rather critical purpose. Here you've got uh, everybody in this painting is the same as Yue Minjun, right? They all have his face. They all have that giant kind of grimacing, fake-looking smile. And Minjun, Yue Minjun says, you know, the smile, the grimace, this is really, uh, you know, this expression that captures the, uh, the essence of pain, right? This kind of weird um, pain that people are feeling after Tiananmen Square. So here, it's the fake smile of cynical, of socialist realism. Yes, everything's great, even if, you know, everything's falling apart, everything's great. Uh, here they all are... Um, um, gesturing and um, um, kind of making fun of the idea of um, making fun of the idea that everything is all right and everything is great. Here is an example of a poster from 1970 then that would be in the socialist realist style that Yue Minjun is alluding to with everybody smiling, everybody happy there with that enthusiastic slogan across the bottom, long live Chairman Mao. There they are in, um, in, um, a, a gathering where everybody's holding up a copy of Chairman Mao's Little Red Book. And even the the palette of cynical realism is alluding to this bright, garish um, color palette of socialist realism in which red is a very predominant color because red is the color of the Communist Party. Here is another example of socialist realism, and you can see where the cynical realists are getting their inspiration. This is a 1950s poster, and there is on the right, a translation of the, the inscription across the bottom, turn China into a prosperous, rich, and powerful, industrialized socialist country under the leadership of the Communist Party and Chairman Mao with your smiling peasant um, standing there with industry in the background and abundant fruits and vegetables in the foreground. This was, uh, what's ironic about this poster is it was created during a period called the Great Leap Forward in 54 and 55 when Chairman Mao commanded that all the peasants who were farmers should leave their farms and go to work in factories. He said, the only way we're going to become a modern nation is if everybody pitches in and helps us to industrialize. 
Sounds great, and yes, it's probably true that China needed to industrialize and modernize. However, what happened was he wouldn't let people work farms. He wanted everybody in the factories, and so nobody's farms were worked. Food rotted in the fields. This initiated a period of famine in which hundreds of thousands of people died across the country of China. And so you have a disconnect between what is represented in these very cheerful and insistent uh, socialist realist posters and what's actually going on in the country. So this is a good example of where cynical realism comes from with those grimaces, with that bright kind of crazy color palette, with everybody gesturing almost madly. It's coming from the background of this feeling that there's a disconnect between the rhetoric of the government and the visual rhetoric of the government and what's actually happening in society. So here's another example, U.A. Minjun's Untitled. This is actually um, a black and white oil painting. It's not a black and white photograph. But here again, you can see um, this is the the, the broken um, um, ground there is actually tiles from Tiananmen Square. And there they are, he and his compatriots, all the same face, all the same grimace, uh, all there um, kind of doing a parody version of socialist realism. Yue Minjun has continued to work with this grimacing figure and to work with themes of individuality and collective identity where everybody looks exactly the same, everybody's grimacing the same, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is a more recent example of a um, kind of sculptural version of, you know, you might expect to see a group of workers exercising in Tiananmen Square under the direction of their factory leader. So here's this kind of um, sculptural version of that. Um, oh, and there's another nice... Uh, yeah, there's another nice poster, uh, socialist realist poster. There's Chairman Mao, Comrade Mao is the greatest Marxist-Leninist of the present age. Uh, again, the same color palette, and that gives you the sense of the style that the cynical realists are taking off after, uh, in particular, Yue Minjun. So here's another one. I don't have the title for this one, but a recent oil painting by Yue Minjun. Uh, and here, the Scholar's Rock series there. Um, I think this is interesting, too, because it's not only cynical realism, but then he's also incorporating the kind of history of China. For those of you in the Chinese class, then, you know, going back to the the scholar elite, the literati of the 17th and 18th century, who would collect things like Scholar's Rocks to be these um, microcosms of the universe. Here's a Yue Minjun, uh, again, a, a a recent sculptural group where you've got these figures that are in um, collective kind of socialist realist you know happy workers postures doing exercises everybody smiling and grimacing um, again the the same kind of uh, themes of collective versus individual identity um, the relationship between the person and the state and all of that is sort of implied and here, interestingly, is one of his contemporary terracotta warriors. This is recent, too. This is the last couple of years. Again, it's a figure of a factory worker who's maybe doing stretches in a, in a collective exercise session. But it also is, in the title, referencing back to the past, to China's um, art historical past, in particular to the terracotta army of the first emperor of China, dating back um, to what, 210 BCE. And here's another example, let's see, contemporary terracotta warriors. They're not terracotta, they're actually cast bronze, but the title is to contemporary terracotta warriors. And there you can see all in the same pose and this sort of, you know, workers exercising in the square posture, um, grimacing in that social, or excuse me, cynical realist grimace, and then the multitude of them referencing back to the whole history of Chinese art and Chinese civilization. And there is just a view of the terracotta warriors of the first emperor just to remind you of what it is that Yue Minjun is referring back to. Uh, he's also done a series that engages with the history of Western art. So Yue Minjun's The Pope from 1997. Uh, if you're in the contemporary art class, you should recognize this as a reference to and to take off not only on Diego Velazquez, the um, 17th century painter, but also, of course, Francis Bacon, who did his um, um, figure with meat in 1954. 
Weimengen also does this uh, kind of uh, engages with the dialogue of the history of Western art, and this makes him really a postmodernist in the very kind of you know typical Western tradition. Here is a girl leading a re le reading a letter by an open window, where he has done a painting, a copy of a uh, Vermeer painting, in which the only thing that he's changed is he's left out the figure of the girl. So you get the setting, you get the fruit on the um, carpet in the foreground, you get the reflection that has that kind of skull-like look to it in the window, but the girl herself has been taken out. So here, again, he's riffing off of art historical tradition, in this case, the West instead of the East. And there's the original girl reading a letter by an open window by Jan Vermeer, uh, just to give you a sense of what it is that, that Yue Men Jun is referencing in that painting. He's also, of course, then showing not only that he knows the history of art in the West as well as the East, but then also that he's got the technical chops to do a copy uh, off of a Vermeer painting. Okay, so that's uh, Cynical Realism and Yue Men Jun. Another artist that I want you to look at, and uh, I should mention that there are some links to websites and uh, videos of some of these artists that are in this week's uh, lecture section. Um, this is Xu Bing's Book from the Sky. This is a installation that he's done in multiple locations now, where you can see there are books laid on the ground, there is text across the back wall of this um, exhibit, there are, is text written or printed on these sheets that are hanging from the sky. The interesting thing about Book from the Sky, and this is an installation that Xu Bing originally did in 1988 in Beijing in an important contemporary show that was um, one of the places where uh, it was a, a show of contemporary artists in Beijing that was one of the places where this talk about democracy was really getting started. And in fact, this show, the show that this was originally shown in was shut down by the Chinese government because of that very reason. Xu Bing's Book from the Sky it's kind of a conceptual installation piece. It is um, all woodblock printed with a couple thousand characters that Xu Bing himself designed. The characters look like Chinese characters. However, they are meaningless. Uh, he just made them up. So although you have a multitude of texts here to look at, none of them are really legible. And Xu Bing actually continues to do work. I've got a link from this week's um, lecture, or from this from this week's uh, folder, that will take you to a recent exhibition he did for, called Book from the Ground, in which he's trying to come up with a universal language of symbols. It's a really interesting interactive project. Uh, this is an earlier example where he's working with um, language and the futility of language, or its incommunication. This is another view of a different version of Book from the Sky. This is a, a Book from the Sky being installed in Queensland, or as it was installed in Queensland, Australia. Um, I don't know if I have any close-ups of the individual characters, but it's again, it's a couple thousand characters of text that are nonsense characters, even though they look like they should be legitimate. They're they're not. Uh, there's a nice close-up of one of the books in Books from the Book from the Sky, and again, he designed all the characters, he created all the books, he printed them, he put them all together. So it's a pretty labor-intensive process, and they're really referencing the history of Chinese culture. Chinese um, writing goes back to the 2000s BCE. Uh, book binding and printing go back to the seven or eight hundreds in China. So, I mean, it's a long tradition here. But then again, although there's this long tradition, it's inscrutable, it's unreadable. And this is in some ways meant to be a comment on the way that culture and tradition had been destroyed during the, the Great Leap Forward and particularly the Cultural Revolution. Um, Xu Bing's dad had been re-educated during the Cultural Revolution, so there's a sort of you know interesting commentary going on here. Uh, there's another view of Book from the Sky, and there's another view of one of the books, where again you can see it looks like a real book, it looks like legit characters, although they're not. And this is some some shots of Book from the Ground. And that again, I encourage you to go to the website for Book from the Ground because you can play around with all the symbols there. Uh, okay, so another example of a reaction to Tiananmen Square and kind of recent contemporary art in China, Wang Guangyi, the Great Castigation Series. This is Coca-Cola from 1983, where again, 
he seems to have been looking at the West. He seems to have been looking at art from um, the pop art movement in this case, particularly guys like Andy Warhol. But he is doing a um, kind of riff not only on the West, but also on um, political propaganda posters of socialist realism that you would typically find in China with those three workers, with the color scheme there, all in the, you know, that's very typical worker iconography, the strong forearm and the big hand. Um, that being combined with the advertising media and there they seem to be stabbing into that, uh, stabbing into that, that logo. Um, this is a, a kind of post Tiananmen art that gets the nickname um, gaudy art, okay, because it incorporates Western advertising. Um, uh, sometimes it's called political pop art as well, gaudy art or political pop art. And Wang Guangyi is the sort of foremost practitioner of this. There's another example, more recent, 2005. There you can see the, um, the guy holding the little red book, the typical workers holding shovels, right? Gesturing in your typical socialist realist fashion, then combined with the Porsche advertising logo. Uh, here's another example of political pop or gaudy art, Xu uh, Yi Hui. This is um, this is, actually reminds me a little bit for those of you in contemporary of the artist Jeff Koons, you know. Um, but again, called political art uh, or political pop or gaudy art, gaudy because it's you know quite colorful and um, and uh, cheesy looking, right? So there's the little red book on top. Um, uh, well, on top is a uh, money. On the bottom, you can see the little red book, which is a little easier to see. It is the little red book is Chairman Mao's book of sayings that every Chinese school kid would get during the um, years of the Cultural Revolution. That would be, you know, you'd have to memorize all the sayings of Chairman Mao. And there it is, opened up on a little bed of flowers. So it's kind of a like a knickknack that your grandma might keep in her cabinet, you know. So it's a um, it's a um, what kitschy. Um, pop culture, low art um, inspiration that's being used here to uh, kind of make a commentary on the, the presence of the Little Red Book in people's lives. And here from the Little Red Book series, this is 192 books. This is a sculpture with all these teeny, they're really teeny tiny little Little Red Books that have been piled up here into this, uh, into this sculpture. Again, it reminds me a little bit of Jeff Koons. You know, it's a found object or um, uh, turned into a sculpture and, and all of that. Um, okay, so another more recent example of, uh, I would just say gaudy art is this. Um, uh, there's a whole series of these. Um, it's a group of three brothers who trained at a technical university in, in sort of graphic design, the Luo brothers. And this is their... I love Tiananmen Square, Beijing, uh, number 29. This is a uh, mixed media work in which they have incorporated Western advertising, traditional socialist realist propaganda imagery like Tiananmen Square, and low art advertising um, from Ch a Chinese perspective. Those chubby little babies are often found on these New Year's cards and decorations. Chubby babies are a sign of good luck. And so, you know, at the New Year, you always see little red babies, uh, especially on a, a little um, chubby babies on a red background. Red traditionally is actually a lucky color in China, as well as then being the color of the Communist Party during the, the um, Communist era. And here you can see the two chubby babies, I love Tiananmen Square. They're standing in front of a little tiny Tiananmen Square and they're holding up a giant burger, right? A giant, what is that, a double, or a Whopper? Um, so, I don't know, Burger King or McDonald's. It's a, a, a melding of these different iconographies into this sort of new form. Here are some examples of these chubby New Year babies that I was talking about. So these are the kind of good luck, um, you know, little paper decorations that you would find around the time of Chinese New Year um, and produced, you know, mass produced all over China. I mean, if you go to a Chinese restaurant here, you can buy them during the New Year. Um, so taking low art of the East and West and, uh, and socialist realist art and melding them all together into this kind of new format. 
This recent series they did in 2006-2007 is called Welcome to the Famous Brands of the World. In other words, welcome, I mean, it kind of has a double meaning, right? Welcoming them to China, also um, um, telling, maybe telling Chinese people, hey, welcome to having these famous brands. So here you've got the chubby babies riding a Coca-Cola light. Those, um, the one riding a Coca-Cola light, which is basically Diet Coke, holding a burger, um, then the two chubby babies riding goldfish, again, a symbol of good luck for the new year. And this is a, an actual, uh, produced by Coca-Cola, Chinese New Year poster, where you've got a rooster for the year of the rooster made out of Coke cans, and then, of course, the red background, uh, the, and you can just make out some of the Coca-Cola logo there at the bottom of that picture. So, I mean, again, really fusing and playing with those boundaries, and I think for those of you who are taking the contemporary class, you can see how there's a sort of, you know, corollary to what's going on in the West in the past few years as well in the work of the Luo brothers with this melding of high and low, with the use of historical um, references, with the kind of playing with boundaries and the use of kitsch that, um, that, that, that should seem very familiar to stuff that we've looked at in the West as well. And here's a statue from the World Famous Brand series, this one called Climbing on Coke for obvious reasons. And here are a couple more of these, um, you know, Coca-Cola burgers figuring very prominently. Um, so, and lots of chubby babies from the Loa Brothers. There on the left, I like it because you can see Tiananmen Square at the bottom, and then even in the bottom center, you can see a poster of Chairman Mao there. And here again, more of the um, Welcome to the World Famous Brand series. And uh, just one more, in this case, Siemens is the company that's being celebrated. And then you've got Roosters and Dragons, Signs of Good Luck. Uh, so I hope you get a sense here of what the Luo Brothers are all about. And obviously got Luo Brothers happy. Uh, so here's uh, 12 of their prints. And then finally, I um, we'll want to talk about an artist who's also become really prominent on the scene, and there's some uh, images uh, of him on YouTube that I've got linked from this week. Uh, this past year, he had a retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum in New York that was called I Want to Believe, and it featured some of his performances, some of his installations from the last 20 years. Uh, Kai Kuo Chung has worked with gunpowder and again this is you know going back to I mean the Chinese invented gunpowder in the ninth century so this is you know using a historic medium uh, and then using the idea of chance using the idea of randomness uh, here for example in his gunpowder drawings this is called drawing for the transient rainbow this is literally using um, using the blast patterns from um, shooting a gun with gunpowder to create an image so it's a found object, it's mechanically assist assisted, it's um, spontaneous, you know, it's taking the control out of the hands of the artist uh, and using that medium, all right, and using the medium of gunpowder and then also being sort of historically um, uh, tied to China. Uh, here, this is a proposal for a piece that he actually did in Valencia, Spain. Um, where he was going to have a series of timed explosions of gunpowder to create this rainbow shape in like 30 seconds over um, the city of Valencia. And it would be a time-limited kind of piece. So again, has some resonance with things that we've seen going on in the West as well with the idea of a, a one-time only um, piece, you know, something that's meant to be seen briefly, um, something that then is also record site specific, um, something that you can only really recapture through film stills and um, or photographs and film. Uh, and if you go on the web, you can actually see the the actual um, event as it was uh, taped, as it happened in Valencia, Spain. This, by the way, was a little bit touch and go that he, whether he was actually going to get to do it or not, because he had planned to do it. Um, he, and it was going to be scheduled, and then, um, you may remember this, a few years ago, the, um, there were bombings on trains in Madrid, uh, a city in central Spain, south central Spain, uh, the largest city in Spain, I believe. And so people had, you know, had started out thinking, oh, this would be a great installation or a great project, but then the idea of gunpowder exploding in a city took on a kind of sinister turn after the 
um, train bombings in Madrid that happened, what, was that six months or so after 9-11? Uh, so eventually the project did go through and uh, did get performed, but he has continued to deal with questions, or to continue to deal with um, the modern political situation in works like this. This is uh, Inopportune that originally created in 2004 was was um, reinstalled at the Guggenheim going up the central tower or the central atrium of the Guggenheim where as you can see it's a oh it's a mid 80s Chevy I think that he's got several of them and then the they they're arranged as if you're looking at stills from a film where the car is kind of flipping and rolling in space it's got these LED um, light sticks coming out of it that flash colors and look a little bit like maybe um, um, fireworks, again, something that a chi the Chinese invented, or can look like cars exploding. And of course, in the modern world, with uh, concerns about terrorism and with the car bombs that we read about all the time in the Iraq War, uh, this has taken on a couple of different variations or meanings. You can see a little bit of what this probably what this looked like in person if you go to the YouTube um, videos that I have posted for this week. So you can see a little bit of this thing in motion. Um, I think it it's better in person than it is in stills, unfortunately. But this will give you a little bit of an idea of what it looks like. There's a close-up of one of the cars. Um, okay, so let's see. So there's Kai Guo Chang that we've looked at briefly. And then one more artist who's a photographer and performance artist that I want to briefly mention, who is also dealing with sort of, you know, political issues in China and is a, a, a good example of the kinds of stuff coming out of China in recent years, Zhang Wan. This is a document of a performance he did in 94 called 12 Square Meters. And um, this is a, a photograph of the per, of the artist himself. What he has done here is he has stripped naked and covered himself in honey, and he sat in a public toilet in a very poor part of the city of Beijing. And then um, he sat there for 12 hours, and during the time he sat there, as you can imagine, in a, a filthy public toilet, he um, got covered in bugs. Uh, and then after the period of time that he sa after he sat there for a while. Um, then he walked from the toilet to a nearby lake and walked into the lake to rinse himself off. Uh, Zhang Wan has said that this performance was to draw attention to the plight of the residents of poorer parts of Beijing. Uh, obviously, the sort of inadequate public sanitation. Uh, he's also said that this was related to... Um, a, a practice of the Chinese government that still seems to go on, and that is, I mean, this is a notorious practice, right? The, the one-child policy in China, which says that essentially all couples are limited to having one child. Uh, this has been a policy that's been in place for, I think, 30 years now, and has led, in one way, it's led to actually some interesting in, in the up-and-coming generation of youngsters, you know, the kindergarten classes now have these incredible imbalances where you'll have 30 boys and one girl in a classroom. Uh, it's led to young men in their 20s are now leaving China and going to Africa to look for wives because there aren't enough young women around to um, marry. Uh, but that set aside, the, the thing that he was actually concerned about and is, is um, protesting or says he's protesting in this piece is the policy of forced abortions That's, um, that has taken place in China where um, if a woman has had one baby um, and gets pregnant again, unless you can afford to pay for a special license exemption so that you can have more than one child, um, the government can force you to have um, an abortion or force you to be sterilized. And there are horror stories about this happening where people would literally be taken physically to an, a clinic and have this done. Um, I don't want to, you know, play up horror stories about China, but this is what Zhang Wan is protesting in this piece. Um, okay, so performance art, politically engaged performance art, that's something that we've also seen in the West, and that's something that is a kind of new, or not new, but a, a, a trend that has been um, developing in the last 15 years in China as well. 
Uh, here's another document of a performance piece. Zhang Wan went back to the village where he grew up and um, engaged the citizens of the village in this piece, which he called to raise the water level in a fish pond, uh, where he literally had all the men and boys of the village walk into a uh, a local pond with the idea that if everybody in if, if all of these people got into the water at the same time there would be enough displacement of water that it would raise the level of the water in the fish pond to symbolize the idea that we're all connected that we all matter that we all make a difference okay and so this is just a document from to raise the water level in a fish pond and again there's a little video that talks a little bit about some performance artists in China particularly Zhang Wan and Kai Guo Chang um, that I recommend that you watch just to get a little bit of a sense of um, what these guys are doing and what they're thinking about.